where we're now looking into neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or right. Parkinson's or Huntington's, right. uh, which is something we announced uh, recently. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to our Trade of Black podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales, and today we're talking cannabis, cannabinoids, pharma, all the above. We bring in once again the CEO of InMed Pharmaceuticals, Eric Adams, back to the podcast. Good day, sir. Good to see you again. Good to be here, Shad. Thanks. How's things? Can you believe we're at the end of a calendar year again? Another one in the books, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, as a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, goodbye and good riddance to 2022. I mean, it's been a tough year uh, in many different ways, but... Um, you know, we're, we're uh, surviving and, and pushing forward and uh, looking forward to the new year. Not to sound like Debbie Downer, but didn't we say that for 2021 and 2020 as well? But For different reasons. For different reasons. We did. You're right. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Well, as I said, it's been a while since we've spoken. Lots going on. Uh, before we get into the recent news and main reasons for this interview, we've seen heavy volume concerning your stock over the last few months for a number of reasons. So let's understand the change in strategy regarding focusing more on your pharma play, meaning your trials, and less on the manufacturing side. So first thing, why was this decision made? Yeah, well, it, it wasn't really a decision to, um, to really change anything. We've been a pharma company since day one. That's been our okay. primary focus. Uh, we always wanted to find the best way to utilize cannabinoids to treat some serious illnesses. Um, the, the manufacturing side was something that we needed to support our efforts in, on the pharma side. And with the acquisition of Bay Medica, we accessed a number of things. We accessed a library of proprietary uh, cannabinoid analogs that are going to be very important for the pharmaceutical drug development. We accessed a lot of manufacturing know-how. Uh, yeah. And really, as a spinoff of that, there was a, a commercial opportunity to sell in bulk uh, these rare cannabinoids uh, to the health and wellness market. Um, and it was kind of in that order that we were interested in, in acquiring Bay Medica. So um, we did invest some into the commercial uh, side of that business in the health and wellness. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't taken off the way we anticipated and okay. the way many people anticipated for a number of different reasons. Um, I think there's still a lot of promise in that area. But uh, really, it was, it was, uh, we wanted to you know, not invest uh, in, in a business that's kind of risky right now and really you know, refocus on our efforts in pharmaceutical and make sure that we have those programs uh, well-funded and, and pushing those forward. So let's look at the forefront then and your potential on your pharma play. Uh, lots to focus uh, on your pipeline and the long-term opportunities it presents. So walk us through, I guess, the different programs you're focused on and what <clears throat> stage of development they're at and, and most importantly, the potential for them. Sure. Well, our most advanced program is in epidermolysis bullosa, which is a devastating genetic skin condition where the integrity of the skin is very poor, yep. leading to very easy bruising and wounding. Um, these are you know, patients and, and typically children who just have wounds over their entire bodies. Mm -hmm. And what, we're in uh, phase two clinical trials right now. And we're, what we're looking to do is uh, treat some of the symptoms associated with this disease. Uh, because it's a genetic disease, we can't really reverse it. You need a gene therapy to do that. But what we want to do is provide a better quality of life for these patients um, by addressing the symptoms that they deal with on a daily basis. And that includes things like pain, um, severe itch, uh, chronic inflammation, yeah. and wound healing. And so we're looking at whether or not uh, CBN, which is a, a rare cannabinoid, in a cream formulation can, can bring benefit to those patients. What is all entailed? Like, you know, we talk about phase two trials and people just, you know, use the term or try to understand, but what is, would you say is the big takeaway as to what's involved when, when operating a phase two trial? Yeah, so um, the phase one trials are just safety typically. You're looking for safety or maybe an early signal of some kind of activity. Uh, but we conducted our phase one trials in healthy volunteers, so we couldn't look for any efficacy because they didn't have the disease that we were targeting. Yeah. Uh, so it proved to be very safe. Uh, in the phase two trials, we're doing what's called a phase 2A, so the first part, where you're looking for signs of efficacy. You're in the patient population that you're targeting, and you're trying to find early signs that help define where you can narrow the focus as you go forward into more advanced clinical trials. So I mentioned those four different areas, the wound healing, pain, itch, inflammation. Uh, we may not look for those to be the endpoints going forward, but what we want to do is find out which one of those are most likely to be um, uh, to, to be most impacted by our therapy. Uh, so these are typically smaller trials, especially in rare disease patients. Um, for this trial, we decided to conduct it in Europe. Um, okay. it, we thought we can move quicker and, and more efficiently uh, in the European patient population. So Has that been across, the case? 
Well, I mean, we, we've, we've run into a lot of other issues on top of what you would normally with a, a rare disease, and that included, you know, COVID. Um, this is a 28-day treatment. Uh, patients uh, have to, you know, uh, apply the drug on a daily basis. It's randomized, so they don't know if they're getting placebo on one wound or, you know, active on the other. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit complicated. So, so being remote from the treatment site or the, the uh, clinical investigation site has, you know, brought in some other complexities that uh, you wouldn't have had if we didn't have COVID sitting on top of us this, this whole last year. Um, but we'll get through it, right? I mean, yeah. you just you yeah. adjust and you get through these things. And you're probably seeing that. Are you seeing that now as we <clears throat> try to move on from COVID with this uh, life that we're now living? Well, it's different in every country, right? So each country is, is at a different phase in terms of getting through COVID. Um, you know, some people had uh, earlier access to vaccines than others. Um, some countries have opened up sooner than others. So all of that plays a role in, you know, how we can get these uh, patients uh, involved in the trial and treated and, and get the data back out of, uh, out of the uh, results. So. Yeah, kind of put my foot in my mouth there, especially what's going on in China right now. Crazy times, to say the least, because uh, as much yeah. as we think we're moving on, it's just can't believe what's going on over there. But uh, getting back to the phase two trials, so just so I can understand for my viewers to understand more, what do you think is like what you're doing that say is different from other companies that focus in this area in the industry? Uh, in this disease or yeah. in cannabinoids in general or the, d the disease itself yeah so um a lot of people have looked specifically at wound healing and the rate in which you can you can uh, assist in in these healing these wounds um that's a very difficult endpoint um it's it's different from patient to patient and it can be different from one side of the body to another uh, so that's probably the most difficult thing that we're trying to measure here uh, we did enroll several patients who did not have wounds at all. They had what we mm. call non-wound itch. And this itch is very wow. severe. It's not like you and I would have, you know, from a mosquito bite. This is a very, very severe thing. And as you know, you may have experienced, uh, if you have poison ivy or something like that, yeah. you will itch it until it bleeds. So you will, itch a, you will itch it until it becomes a wound. Because somehow mentally we can deal with a wound more than we can deal with an incessant itch, right? Totally. So, and these patients suffer from a very extreme uh, itch. So, and, and because their skin is fragile, you can imagine how, how dangerous that is for them. So that's a very important outcome. So maybe that's the one where we end up, um, you know, moving forward uh, into the next uh, trials as, as, as a primary endpoint. So to understand uh, industry trends a little better, what are other major uh, pharma companies uh, who have been active in the cannabinoid space the past, meaning like what are the type of indications uh, are they looking at? And with that researching, uh, does it align with what you're doing? It, to some degree it does. Um, you've seen a lot of clinical trials, uh, early clinical trials looking at CBD in particular. Yeah. Uh, why CBD? Well, it was very easy to access for a long period of time. Um, so after THC, it's the most abundant one in the plant, uh, and people could get their hands on it, and therefore they can move it into research uh, uh, in a number of different areas. Um, where there's been a lot of uptake is in, um, you know, uh, brain disease, if I can generalize it that way. Yep. Uh, yep. In particular, uh, GW Pharma has the, and now Jazz Pharma, uh, has the indication for certain forms of epilepsy. Um, and again, you know, something that, that's going on in the brain. Uh, other companies have looked at, at similar indications, um, and that kind of led ultimately to some of our research uh, where we're now looking into neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's or right. Parkinson's or Huntington's, right. uh, which is something we announced uh, recently. Um, so we think there's a very high promise. I personally have always felt that's a very interesting area for this class of drugs and for a very important reason. Number one, they hit a number of different receptors in the body. Cannabinoids okay. interact with the human body in a lot of different ways. And you need to suss out which cannabinoid is going to have which effect on these different receptors. But secondly, we know that they can safely cross from the blood into the brain. And not all drugs can do that. And these do it naturally. So you have this, this class of compounds that, you know, by and large can get into the brain and have an effect to, with the receptors in the brain. So you, you have this kind of, uh, you know, uh, ability with this class of drugs to get in there. And, and now we're trying to suss out how and which ones might have an impact on neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. I got to ask. 
the world's population is aging and you're seeing dementia alzheimer's like cases like it's it's it was an epidemic even before COVID hit and i'm not saying COVID was related to that but we're really see, starting to see as to the aging population and some of the uh, uh degenerative diseases that you know a lot of the older uh demographic is going through if i were to ask you like 15 20 years from now what specific role do you think cannabinoids will have pertaining to these diseases like do you think you know this disease will change based off of uh, the research that's being conducted today uh, i think it will um, i think that a lot of money has been invested in pursuing one specific avenue in particular in alzheimer's and that's the generation of these beta amyloid plaques uh, that you know to be non-technical it gunks up the system and uh, the neurons can't communicate with each other and right. function as normal. So a lot of money uh, from very big, uh, you know, very smart companies has gone into try to clear that away. Uh, they've figured out how to clear the beta amyloid plaques away or, or slow them or, or prevent them, um, but it's not had the outcome in the patients that they would have liked. Uh, you would have liked to have seen uh, potentially some reversal of their, uh, deco their, their cognitive decline Okay. Um, or um, if not a reversal, a significant slowing. And it's been very difficult to show that in their Still. clinical trials. So I think that's one step that's in the right direction, but I think there's gotta be other approaches taking other mechanisms of action in order to really address this disease. And that's not unusual. I mean, if you just think of cancer, you know, there's uh, any given tumor or tumor type, there's yeah. 10 ways to attack it. Sometimes you use two or three of them uh, of these ways in combination to really get to that and have a, a, a meaningful impact. I think Alzheimer's and some of these other diseases is going to be similar. You're going to need multiple uh, approaches to really be impactful in the disease. When you focused on this, though, like wh why was that decision then made? Like what opportunities did you see uh, besides the obvious with uh, when you look at the stats as to what's uh, accumulating worldwide? Yeah, um, very high unmet medical need for sure. For sure. Uh, you know, growing patient populations. Um, but this really is a spin out of what we saw in our glaucoma program. So okay. that's a preclinical program we have. We're, we're trying to push that through to uh, human trials, which is still a, a little bit of ways off. But what we saw are two things. And the first one is that cannabinoids can reduce the interocular pressure that's associated with glaucoma yep. uh, and return the eye, if you will, to a normal state. Again, these are very broad comments, but essentially that's what you're trying to do. But independent of the ability to, to lower the interocular pressure, we saw that cannabinoids go to the retina, they go to the nerve cells that are responsible for vision, and they protect those from death. So wow. they can die naturally of natural causes, or this pressure in the eye is pushing back on the retina, and that's killing those nerve cells. So we thought, well, that's, that's really interesting. The, you, you don't have to treat... I mean, you could go to a normal eye that yeah. doesn't have glaucoma, and you can protect those neurons as well, and maybe prolong vision. And maybe it's from a different disease. It's not even in glaucoma. So that's something that uh, you know we found very interesting. And then we said, well, CBN turned out to be the best cannabinoid that we researched, uh, a whole panel of, of cannabinoids. Yeah. Yeah. What about other types of neurons in other parts of the body? And so we started testing in different um, uh, neural cell models from different parts of the body. Yeah. And what we saw is that a different cannabinoid has a stronger impact on neurons in the brain. Mm. And a different cannabinoid has a different impact in other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. So it, it, tend, it tended to be very tissue specific as to which cannabinoid was having the, the, the biggest effect. When we saw that neural protective effect in other models, and in particular in the Alzheimer's model, we thought, well, this could be a really interesting approach. Um, and we saw not only kind of the, the preservation of the neuron, yeah. but we actually saw that they were regrowing. So, you know, neurons kind of need to connect right. uh, so that, you know, they can, they, can, they can, you know, have a conversation with each other and that passes through the body. Right. But in some of these diseases, they, they shrink and they start pulling away from each other. Okay. <clears throat> what we saw within the presence of some cannabinoids is these start to regrow. So really? if you think of the Alzheimer's model, maybe it's not just the gunk that's in between them that's blocking up the communication. Yeah. Maybe they're too far apart, even after you get rid of the beta amyloid. Maybe this, this tendency to regrow in the presence of a cannabinoid is going to be another important component 
of, of this treatment. So that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to figure that out. Um, we're still early in, in preclinical models. Uh, we want to continue to advance what we call now the 900 series program, INM 900, uh, and really start to answer those questions. But we're, okay. we're very early on and, and we do have a ways to go. So for the everyday person, if there's one big takeaway that you have found or at least learned so far when it comes to cannabinoids and uh, neuron degenerative diseases, um, what do you think is one important thing that people may not understand or they're unaware of as to what the potential of cannabinoids could have towards these diseases moving forward? Well, again, it's, um, it's a pretty broad question, but you it's know. a broad question. You know, a lot of the uh, you know monoclonal antibodies, which is a different class of compounds, uh, you know, the biggest class of compounds in, in pharmaceutical development and commercialization, they tend to be you know kind of rifle shots. They specifically target one kind of thing that's going on, be it in tumors or in you know Alzheimer's and other diseases, and okay. it takes out that target. Um, cannabinoids are more of a shotgun approach. As I mentioned, they hit a lot of different targets, and it's maybe this multiple target effect that is, is ultimately going to bring the most benefit. Interesting. Either as standalone or in combination with these rifles, right? So, so because they hit so many different targets, most people you know, are familiar with the endocannabinoid system, the CB1 and CB2 yep. receptors. It goes way beyond that. I mean, there's, there's dozens of different receptors that these can hit, and it's really kind of picking and choosing which cannabinoid hits the right targets for any specific disease. And, and that's, that's a good thing. That's, that's a good about. thing, right? I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Bold prediction. If you were to sit here and look at 2023 for the overall cannabinoid industry as a whole, what would you say it would be? Well, I think if companies have the proper access to capital, you're going to continue to see a lot of things move forward into the, into, into the clinic or moving from phase one to phase two or phase two to phase three. Yeah. Um, you know, these are, these are inherently pretty safe compounds. Uh, you've not seen, well, you know, there's never been a recorded overdose <laughs> in the history of mankind related to a cannabinoid. Um, but you've, you've not seen any severe toxicities, I don't believe, in, in any of the early work in this field. Uh, we know that they address a lot of different uh, receptors in the body. Uh, we know they can get into the brain and do some in, important work there with, with different receptor sites. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even with everything we're doing, everything that, you know, GW slash Jazz Pharma has done, uh, Zynerba, all these other companies, <clears throat> I really think we're, we're just scratching the surface. That's great. I like the term shotgun approach. It's pretty accurate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, uh, happy holidays to you and the family. But let's keep in touch. And it was great catching up with you today, Eric. Thanks, Shad. And uh, happy holidays to you and your and your listeners. And um, we're looking forward to a really exciting uh, 2023. All the best. We need it uh, everywhere. Positivity, <laughs> right? That's right. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. All right. Take care. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. So what'd you think of the interview? If there's any information that you want to know more of or want to learn about, then provide us with feedback by leaving a comment below. And if you like what we're producing, then feel free to subscribe to our channel, share this video with your network, and as well, click on that bell for all notifications because we would not be here without you. We appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everyone.